Let's look uh, anatomically for just a moment and consider the source of some of these biogenic amine transmitters, beginning with dopamine. Well, uh, I mentioned some of the places where dopamine is uh, released. Dopamine is uh, derived from cells that have their cell bodies here in the midbrain, which is uh, at the very top of the brainstem, in a collection of compact cells known as the substantia nigra pars compacta, and right adjacent to that is a region called the ventral tegmental area. Here we have cells that have their somata here, and they send axons to important parts of the brain, such as the basal ganglia, specifically the striatum, which is part of the basal ganglia and from the ventral tegmental area projections into medial temporal lobe structures such as the amygdala, as well as to this ventral and medial aspect of the prefrontal cortex. So dopamine is a very important neuromodulator in all of these places. Here, uh, just to uh, highlight uh, a little bit of neuroanatomy, uh, we have a cross-section through the forebrain, as illustrated in the upper right of this slice, uh, slide, shows you about where we're looking. And I want to draw your attention to the center of this slice. So you'll notice uh, labeled number 11 here, we have this uh, dark substance, which sits in the midbrain. And that dark substance is, in fact, the substantia nigra, which, of course, is Latin for dark substance. So here we've got the uh, cell bodies of the neurons, that synthesize and release dopamine at some distance at their axon terminals up in the basal ganglia and in the cortex. And in the medial part of this region where we have dark substance, uh, that's our ventral tegmental area. And that too is a place where the cell bodies of these neurons reside that uh, send their axons up into structures associated with the limbic forebrain and release dopamine there. Well, norepinephrine is another important small molecule neurotransmitter, and uh, norepinephrine is derived from cells who have their home in the brainstem, but now in the dorsal part of the pons in a structure called the locus ceruleus. Uh, the locus ceruleus is another place where we find black substance, or actually the locus ceruleus means blue spot. If we are lucky enough to cut a section through the tegmentum of the pons just right, we might see these two little spots that look sort of a deepish grayish blue color. Uh, those are the locations of where we find our cell bodies of neurons that are producing norepinephrine and releasing it in various places in the brain, really just about everywhere in the brain and even down into the spinal cord uh, do these cells grow their axons. So uh, all of these biogenic amines uh, have in common a limited number of cells whose cell bodies are in the brainstem that grow axons that branch and grow profusely throughout various parts of the forebrain, hindbrain, and even the spinal cord. One last example is the neurotransmitter serotonin. So serotonin uh, comes from a group of cells that are found in a couple of different places in the brainstem. They tend to be found right along the midline in a group of nuclei that we call the seam nuclei or the raphe nuclei. Raphe means seam, so right along a seam where the two sides of the brainstem come together. Uh, that's why, where we find our cell bodies that release serotonin. And, and as I mentioned, serotonin is a very important neuromodulator. neuromodulator. Uh, serotonin uh, appears to be a molecule that, um, when out of a proper physiological uh, balance, can lead to various affective disorders. Uh, many of our drugs that we use to restore uh, normal health with respect to affective disorder uh, act by selectively blocking the reuptake of serotonin, uh, thereby increasing the synaptic concentrations of of that drug in important brain structures. Okay, well, there are more animations to view if you care to see uh, some summary of some of the uh, biochemistry uh, 
and uh, some of the molecular biology regarding the function of these biogenic amine synaptic systems, I would encourage you to view animation 6.3 and 6.5 that review the organization of dopamine and serotonin synapses. Okay, at this point, I think we're ready to switch gears just a bit and talk about the neuropeptide neurotransmitters. So as I mentioned, the neuropeptide transmitters are larger molecules. They're made of a number of amino acids that are covalently bonded to small peptides. Uh, sometimes they can be rather short, or sometimes they can be of considerable size. So, as you might imagine, uh, these molecules must be handled somewhat differently in the presynaptic terminal, and indeed they are. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. But um, before we talk more about how they're handled in the presynaptic terminal, let's just make a few points about their physiology. So the neuropeptides mediate slower and more long-lasting effects than most of our small molecule transmitters, and that's because the neuropeptides seem to interact with metabotropic types of receptors. And as we'll discuss, these are receptors that require cellular metabolism in order to mediate their function, and all of that takes time. So the neuropeptides mediate slower and more long-lasting synaptic effects, some of which can even go on for hours to days. Uh, depending upon the downstream effects of the metabolic pathways that are activated. Some of the important uh, neurotransmitters in this category uh, include what's shown here in this slide, the enkephalins. So there are a number of different enkephalins that are important. The enkephalins are opioids that have analgesic effects in the brain. And so uh, these bind to receptors in various places, including the spinal cord, um, other important peptide transmitters are substance P, which is very important in modulating the transmission of pain signals in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And many of our hypothalamic releasing hormones that are secreted into the portal circulation uh, from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary are neuropeptides, as are the hormones that are released uh, directly in the posterior pituitary into the bloodstream from hypothalamic neurons that send their axons into the uh, neurohypothesis. So these hypothalamic hormones are other examples of neuropeptides. And lastly, let's consider the activities of some neurotransmitters that are still relatively poorly understood. And for that reason, we call them unconventional neurotransmitters, uh, not because they're necessarily so different from our small molecules and our peptides. In some cases, they are but mainly because we don't yet have a full understanding of their mechanisms of action. And so let's begin by talking about the purinergic neurotransmitters. So these include our purines, such as adenosine triphosphate. So you're all familiar with this molecule from your studies of cellular metabolism. You know that ATP is the energy currency uh, for cells. And uh, what you may not have known is that it actually uh, has some uh, biological activity at synapses in the nervous system. So ATP can be co-released with other small molecule neurotransmitters. Once it's in the extracellular space, ATP is typically metabolized into adenosine, uh, and adenosine itself can have its own biological activity. Uh, adenosine tends to uh, bind to various receptors, and these receptors have various functions in different kinds of brain circuits. One important circuit where adenosine is important is in the hypothalamus. And adenosine appears to build up throughout our day and appears to be an important trigger that leads to drowsiness. So the more our cells in the hypothalamus are consuming energy, the more adenosine builds up in the extracellular fluids. That seems to be um, something like a, uh, an index of our state of fatigue and the degree to which we require sleep. Well, uh, one thing many of us do, uh, I myself am guilty of this, is that we fight this system by consuming caffeinated beverages. And what these caffeinated beverages do is they block adenosine receptors. So the xanthines, including caffeine uh, and theophylline, uh, they are blocking the receptors that are mediating this natural sense of drowsiness that will we think in some way uh, have a restorative uh, function on brain circuits.
Another of the so-called unconventional neurotransmitters that's uh, fairly recently been discovered are a um, series of molecules that are derived from membrane lipids called endocannabinoids. Uh, these molecules are hydrophobic, so when synthesized they can freely diffuse across plasma membranes and they bind to receptors that are also bound by the psychoactive components of cannabis, uh, hence their, their name endocannabinoids. So these include some very interesting receptors such as the CB1 receptor which is present in high concentrations in structures associated with the brain's reward system. Uh, it's also present throughout the cerebral cortex and in the cerebellum, uh, in the basal ganglia. So uh, lots of places where uh, we think that the drug of abuse, the, the cannabinoids derived from cannabis, uh, have their effects on cognition and sensory and motor function. So these endocannabinoids uh, seem to have some interesting physiological roles in modulating plasticity, especially plasticity at inhibitory synapses. And you can read more about that in the textbook, if you like, and figure 6.19. We'll come back to this when we talk about mechanisms of synaptic plasticity in a future tutorial. One final neurotransmitter